So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you, um, not in person, but via the miracle of technology, uh, part of our hybrid convention, uh, Doug Cuthand. Thank you. Oh, uh, good evening, everybody. First of all, I'd like to apologize for not being there in person. It had been my wish to be there in person, but uh, my wife uh, had a conference in Vancouver and I went with her. So <laughs> here I am uh, on the West Coast. Uh, yeah, but anyway, it's, uh, I'm very glad to be here and be able to talk to uh, uh, this organization because I've done a lot of work recently with farmers and uh, uh, I wasn't raised a farmer, but I certainly have grown to appreciate uh, uh, the work and the lifestyle and everything else that goes with it. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to talk a little bit about reconciliation in Canada and what we're doing. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I've done in, uh, in well, some reconciliation, also some work with my band as a land entitlement trustee and a few other things. First of all, um, this was a special year for me because uh, our family, uh, we, we, um, I was gonna say celebrate, but that's not really the proper word. My aunt Jean Goodwill, who's formerly Jean Cuthan, was, uh, had an icebreaker named after her by the Canadian Coast Guard. And it was uh, a very special occasion for us. We'd, we'd waited two years because of COVID but this summer we went down to Sydney, Nova Scotia and took part in the investiture of the, of the, the what is a medium uh, sized icebreaker. Um, my Aunt Jean was one of the, was the first, I believe, uh, indigenous nurse here in Saskatchewan. She uh, worked, uh, did her work at the Holy Family Hospital. Uh, her, she trained there, became a registered nurse, and then she served in Black LaRange up at the uh, uh, nursing station up there and down in Fort Capel. And uh, then of all things, she went over to uh, out, out to Bermuda and nursed there for a while. She told me the reason she did that was she was completely burned out from working in, um, in Northern Saskatchewan. They had a small health center there, uh, three people, and they were working basically 24 hours a day, uh, birthing babies and taking fish hooks out of uh, American tourists and everything under the sun. Anyway, uh, so it was a really, uh, oh, else she went on to a career in the civil service and uh, <clears throat> culminating in a special assistant to the health minister, Monique Bejan. So she worked in the field of health and in the civil service for most of her life. And she was a, a valuable, uh, made a valuable contribution to her people. When we talk about uh, reconciliation, the uh, Canadian Coast Guard had a ship named the, Canadian, named the Cornwallis. Now, anybody who's lived in Maritimes or familiar with Cornwallis will know he was the uh, British uh, um, governor of Nova Scotia and uh, probably the Atlantic provinces at the time. And uh, uh, one of the things he did was uh, he, he committed genocide against the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet people on those uh, that lived in the islands originally. Uh, he uh, put a bounty on the, the native Canadians that lived there and uh, has been uh, an object of scorn and hatred by our people for, each, for generations. Uh, this would have been in 1752 or something like that. Anyway, uh, the, the ship, the Cornwallis was renamed this summer and was named after Colpet Hobson, who was a Mi'kmaq chief who signed the treaty in the 1750s. And so the ship, the name Cornwallis has been dropped in reconciliation and, and the name of a Mi'kmaq chief has been put in place. So I, I was very happy to see that. And it was a, it's, it's a positive step because this act of reconciliation, it's, it's going at many different levels. It's taking place in, in school rooms and in uh, government and uh, all kinds of different institutions. So what you need to do now is to take it the next step and bring it into people's homes. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we must remember that um, here in Saskatchewan, we're, uh, we've gone through an awful lot of changes 
in the past uh, three decades to vote. First of all, uh, we've had uh, people from, from, the, from the farms have uh, moved away and many of the family farms have disappeared. And a lot of the people who grew up in these family farms uh, forget or, or, or haven't remembered where they came from, really. Uh, there was a, a, a back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when the West was settled, there was a very strong connection between our people and the incoming settlers. Uh, it became apparent to our people that uh, the uh, settlers that were coming into Canada were not the uh, business leaders of the East and the British uh, elite or anything like that. Um, that they were the ones that cleared the plains and sold the land and made all the money. But the people that came in as settlers were common people, people that came from Britain and the Ukraine and Germany and France and other countries across Europe. And uh, they came with basically nothing. And a lot of them really had to struggle. And so at the beginning, a lot of our people uh, met with them and, and worked with them and uh, helped them out. Uh, help them. Uh, they would provide raw meat, for example. They'd go out and hunt and bring back a deer or two for some of these families. There's the story in uh, uh, Blaine Lake area of uh, Dukabor family or Dukabor community. The men were away and the women were trying to plow. And they, they, they were all hitched to this plow and they were trying to break the soil and really suffering and getting nowhere. And it was really hard work. And uh, the people from the local Muskeg Lake Reserve, uh, Cree people, uh, was, saw this. And uh, later on, they came by with a, uh, a, a team of horses. And uh, they loaned it to them to, uh, to break, the, break the land and get started. And uh, at the time, it was, um, it was illegal for our people to leave the reserve without a pass from the Indian agent. But having said that, our, uh, our people really, with these silly rules like this, they broke the law at every opportunity. They, did, they, they, they would try to do whatever they could to, to get away from it. So they, they deliver at the risk of getting, uh, you know, their fingers wrapped by the Indian agent. They came over with a team of horses and loaned it to these, uh, these new settlers. So, you know, just in that simple act of kindness, they helped out the local people. Now, in other examples, like I said, a lot of these, well, most of them, nobody climbed off the train with a horse. So everybody um, uh, that came to settle and, and work in prairies here had to get a team of horses and, and, and get together the equipment to settle. So our people uh, made quite a good living uh, breaking horses and selling them to settlers. Uh, south of my reserve, I'm from the Little Pine Reserve, which is located on the Yellowhead Highway, halfway between Lloydminster and uh, North Battleford. And uh, the uh, Manitou Lake pasture is to the south of us. Well, at one time, the Manitou Lake pasture was a big pasture for where our people kept horses and they uh, craned them and broke them and sold them to settlers. So there was, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, commerce that went on between us. And we, we assisted and helped and, and, and sold uh, different horses to, you know, to help these new farmers out. Um, there's, a, there's one kind of funny story about that. Uh, there's a family, they, they, they live in Alberta now because uh, all the people were removed from that land and, went and, and put onto the nearby reserves. And in Alberta, there's the Sun Child and O'Chiefs bands near the Rocky Mountain House. And so the Sunshine Reserve contains a lot of people from Saskatchewan that were, that were moved over there. Anyway, this one fellow sold a lame, uh, sold a horse to a Frenchman. And it was a, um, it had some kind of ep epilepsy. The horse would walk around for a while and then he just collapsed. And then he'd get back up and he'd be okay. But anyway, he, uh, he sold his horse to a Frenchman. And the French, uh, well, he, he, he came back a few days later trying to get his money back. And the, uh, uh, could, he, the guy was nowhere to be found. Anyway, the story got out and the man was known as the French cheater. And somewhere in Indian Affairs, some clerk 
put the two words together and called them French Eater. And that's where the name came from, the, the family name, it still exists. And it's, it's, a, it's a misnomer, but it's a funny story about, uh, you know, the selling horses to these, these people. But anyway, uh, it, sadly, the people were all removed and put on different, uh, different um, pieces of land and uh, there were different reserves. And uh, this was during the 19, it was in during the early 50s when they actually broke up the Manitou Lake uh, community. Now, uh, my reserve never had much good land. We, our reserve is five miles by five miles. The Battle River runs through the middle of it. So we're in a valley. Uh, the, the north side of it is all uh, sand hills. And the south side, well, some bottom land, most of it is, uh, is not good for farming. So our people had to work off the reserve. We had to uh, uh, seek out employment someplace else. And uh, my dad told me that uh, during the, uh, when, when he was growing up in the 1930s, they would work on threshing crews and they cleared land and they, they did this sort of thing. And uh, my grandfather used to work with a local farmer and the local farmer's family is still there right beside the reserve. And uh, they also worked on threshing crews as well. There was a, a big deal in the summer. They'd go, in the summer, they'd go to, they'd work on the threshing crews. So, uh, <clears throat> so we, on the other hand, we had to deal with the uh, Department of Indian Affairs and uh, the Department of Indian Affairs is staffed by some of the most impractical uh, individuals you'll ever find. There's stories of uh, uh, weirdos and oddballs and stuff that went to work with Indian Affairs. They had what? They had a uh, practice they called peasant farming. And they didn't allow our people to get any modern tools. So if you can imagine, they were out there supposing to break the land. They were given shovels and hoes, and those kind of things to clear the land and, and break it. And uh, they were given scythes and sickles to harvest, all this sort of stuff. They, they, these guys believed that we had to evolve just like they had, but only five centuries earlier. And so it, it became, a, it, it, was a, it was a self defeating sort of thing. Our people just couldn't, couldn't farm like that. It was just, it was just impossible. You can't break a, a prairie with a shovel, it's just not done. So, they also had a permit system. So if we had to sell anything, we had to get a permit from the Department of Indian Affairs. And that was used as a political tool. So if someone made a fuss or, or, or acted up or was a nuisance or, or something, any reason or a political opponent, the, the, the Indian agent would not allow them to sell their produce off reserve. So as a result, a lot of our farmers uh, would grow things and basically have to give them away to local people because they couldn't sell them. So we, we never really got off on a good way in farming. Although I will say that um, because of our history, we were horse people and uh, we did take to uh, cattle and uh, raising horses, this sort of thing. So we, uh, we weren't what I would call dirt farmers, but we were rather the kind of uh, ranchers and that sort of thing. So these stories have to be told to the next generation because so many people, uh, of the grandchildren of, our, of the people we worked for have moved off the reserve, uh, gone way away from farming and uh, they've forgotten their roots. They've forgotten the way we worked with each other in the past. So when we talk about reconciliation, we have to remember that some of the, the good things that happened in the past. Uh, reconciliation, I see is a funny word. It's, uh, it's as if you have a falling out with your wife and then you uh, get back together again. That's called, rec that's when you reconcile. But uh, in this case, we weren't really, didn't really have a falling out. We just sort of grew apart. And uh, there was a lot of misunderstanding and that sort of thing. So that's how we have to, to, to get together and uh, tell those old stories to each other and remember how our grandparents and great grandparents worked together at one time. Now, the funny thing is that uh, in 1992, the whole situation became reversed because 
we signed what they called Treaty Land Entitlement Framework Agreement. Now this agreement, uh, about 27 First Nations in Saskatchewan and more profound later on, didn't have the proper amount of uh, land under the terms of the treaty. Under the terms of the treaty, the, every, the land was supposed to be allotted as a, 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 a section of land for a family of five. That was how it was, it was allotted. Or it, it works out to 127 acres per person. And uh, some of the land, some of the reserves were quite quite a bit under uh, un, under surveyed. Um, and uh, my reserve in particular, we had uh, we were we were short 30,000 acres of land, and we were only five by five, which is uh, uh, 25 sections of land, which is actually less than half of we were assigned, we were supposed to be getting. So uh, we got $25 million plus we had to get 30,000 acres of land. That was called a shortfall. And then with the land money left over, we could buy more land. So in about, um, this, was, this was the largest at the time. It was the largest agreement in Southern Canada. Uh, brought close to a billion dollars into the province of Saskatchewan, and it was it was considered a major um, it was a major uh, cash inflow for the province, and it was a major uh, increase for us as well. So, my reserve, but uh, for five years they they kind of floundered around <laughs> and uh, didn't get much land purchased, and then they put out a call for new trustees. And I applied, and uh, they uh, appointed me a trustee along with four other guys. So there was five of us, and then the of the group appointed me the chairman. And so I was the chairman of the trust uh, for the next twenty years. And during that period of time, we purchased fifty thousand acres of land, and we uh, it was it was a we we. Tripled, I guess we we made, we made the size the size of reserve a lot bigger, and we uh, we now have a steady income from leased land that exceeds about one point three million dollars annually. Now this was really um, this was really interesting because, um, like I said, we reversed everything seemed to be reversed at this time. Uh, we had to buy land and lots of it. And uh, we had to, uh, we couldn't spend it all on one big piece of land. We had to buy land at a certain amount of money per acre to begin with. So we'd, we would be able to fulfill our shortfall. So we were buying land at around $300, $400 an acre. Um, the most expensive land we bought was land near Saskatoon. And we paid $1,000 an acre for that land. Now today, uh, that that formula just wouldn't work. The price of land has doubled and tripled. And then outside of Saskatoon, it's more than five times now. So we just hit the ground at the right time. And um, we were purchasing land uh, from farmers. We, we, we began our uh, land assembly in an area to the east of North Battleford. The reason we chose that area was because there were no for the first 30,000 acres, we had to get all the land, including all the mineral rights. So we had to get land that uh, didn't have uh, disposed minerals. So we found the land east of North Battleford had a lot of that. Plus it was very good quality land as well. And we found ourselves we were buying from small farmers. And uh, it was quite interesting because uh, we didn't have to advertise. We didn't chase around like carpet baggers or anything like that. The word got out we were buying in the area and uh, we had a land buyer who, who met with everybody and talked to them. And uh, people were just were calling him up left and right. And we found that uh, most of the people selling their land were men or families where the farmers were in their seventies and one fellow was even in his eighties. And uh, the younger generation had gone to school. They were working off the land, off the cities, in the cities. They were pursuing careers. They were doing all kinds of different things. And so they, 
the family farm was on the wane at that point. Plus, and there's the other thing, the corporate farmers were starting to, uh, to grow. We had three farmers that we were leasing land to at one time, and each one of them had over 10,000 acres. Now, 10,000 acres will support um, a Hutterite colony with 100 people. That's the average size of a Hutterite colony is 10,000 acres and 100 people. Nowadays, a corporate farm is one or two families and 10,000 acres. So you can see how things have changed. But anyway, getting back to the people that we dealt with, we, we made some really good uh, moves because we were in a different kind of game we weren't buying land to speculate. We weren't buying land to do a quick flip or, or to farm right away. So we'd uh, cut a deal with a farmer and then we would uh, do what we call a 6% lease back. We take the value that we paid him and then for 6% per year, he could lease it back. And quite a few of them did that. They wanted to get one more crop in or they, you know, just, they, they weren't ready to quit farming, but they, they needed the security that we offered. Um, or, or some others would uh, just lease the farmyard and do a dispersal of their equipment. So in any way, in any case, we didn't force people to move. In fact, we were quite happy to keep them there and to let them exist and let them last as long as they wanted to. So that, that was, uh, uh, we, there was no pressure. And so we would buy a farm and then they would gradually move off. And uh, then we'd take the land and lease it to uh, other farmers when they were finished with it. We had a, a, some other interesting cases of elderly people who sold us their land. And there was one fellow, he was a small landowner. He only had two quarters of land. He was a bachelor and he was the last of his line. He didn't have any kids or anything. And uh, he was afraid, he wanted to sell his land, but he was afraid that he wouldn't have enough to buy a house and he wouldn't have enough to, uh, to live comfortably or live you know, for the rest of his life. So what we did was we provided him with a mortgage out of our money. We, we picked out a house in the local town. And back then, I'm, just, I'm talking 20 years ago, but still real, real estate in small towns is, is not as that expensive. He bought a nice little house for $20,000. And uh, he stayed there for about 10 years. When he finally passed, we, uh, we, uh, took the house and sold it and uh, everything worked out. And so uh, what we did was we uh, were able to, it was a win-win. We were able to get the land we wanted because it fitted in with our land assembly. And we were also able to let him live in dignity. And uh, it was not a, uh, there was no real harm done to either party. I thought we, we handled that very well. So there was sort of different things like this that we did to, to make things, um, you know, compatible and work out and everything like that. So uh, I think uh, some, one of the other stories was that uh, one little town was in danger of losing their school because uh, there was probably hardly any kids in the school anymore. And so what uh, we had been doing was as the farmers retired, uh, we put our people into the houses, they rented from us and uh, they would be working in North Battleford. So there was a, a commute for them, but they still, it worked out. And so they moved their families out there and we put enough people into this local school that the uh, school district couldn't shut it down. And it's still, uh, still a functioning school right now. And it's quite interesting because uh, kids in the school are, are um, uh, they're, they're playing hockey together, they're uh, learning together, they're having a great time together. And it's, uh, it's, it's in an area where there really wasn't too many reserves or too many contact with the indigenous people at all. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's created a, a new type of community in, in, in that area. So um, th this, uh, this, this, this 10 year period, 20 year period, that I served as a trustee, we, we witnessed the, the family farms uh, disappearing. It was very sad to watch. But on the other hand, it was, uh, it was almost, I hate to say inevitable, but the young people had, uh, it was harder and harder to farm, you know, five or six sections of land. 
and uh, it was easier to get an education than work in in industry or, or in the government or something like that. So you know, one by one, the people moved away and the farmers the farms have disappeared, which is quite sad because now the big the big farmers they'll either live in a local town or even the city. They'll have a big yard and their equipment. They may have a couple of hands working for them, and then they'll bring people in for harvest and uh, planting. But really, they they the culture and the way of life that we have in rural Saskatchewan and probably the prairies too is uh, sadly disappearing. And it's sad to see it go because we uh, we're, we're, we were a part of that. And uh, now, as a friend of mine once told me, there's no, going to be nobody left on the prairies but Hutterites and Indians. And that's, that's sort of the way it's coming down. A lot of these little towns are disappearing. You go by them, there's just a bunch of empty buildings. So it's, um, it, it's uh, like I said, it's, it's a change. And uh, this, uh, uh, this is this is something we were, were, were part of, and I watched it grow and, while I was a, a trustee for my reserve. Uh, when we started the treaty land entitlement process, one of the things we wanted to do, uh, well, we, we talked to the elders, and they gave us a, a list of things they wanted us to look into for purchasing land. And one of the things they wanted was land with the cultural and historical significance. And we didn't really know exactly what they had in mind. We bought a piece of land close to the reserve, which was just a pasture, but uh, they loved it. And they now we hold our sun dances and uh, our students cultural camp out there. So that little piece of land filled that up. But uh, uh, our people, our chief signed treaty in number six at Fort Walsh in the Cypress Hills. That's where we originally came from. And we were moved north because they didn't want uh, any uh, any indigenous people in the hills. It was too close to the United States border. So anyway, we were moved north. But what we did was we went, we went uh, down to the Cypress Hills. I found 10 quarters of land, which were just to the south of Fort Walsh in the hills there. And so we, uh, we got, we, they were leased, they were, it's government land. We bought it from the province and we paid out the lease to the farmer or rancher who was retiring anyway. So now we have 10 quarter sections of land uh, just behind uh, Fort Walsh. If anybody's familiar with that, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, up in the hills, there's a bluff and there's a kind of a, like a, it looks like a question mark of trees on the, on the side of the hill. It's called War Bonnet Butte. That's our land of War Bonnet Butte. And it's, uh, it's some of the, it's, it's, when you get to the top of the hill, it's the same uh, altitude as the uh, town site at Banff. It's one of the highest places in between the Rocky Mountains and uh, for uh, the um, Laurentians. So it's a, it's, it's a very special place. And it had a lot of um, meaning to our people because we, we lived in those hills we spent our summers on the plains chasing buffalo. And in the winter, we would uh, winter in the hills with other tribes. But uh, basically, that was, uh, that was very close to us. Now, we didn't realize it at the time. But what we were doing was part of what they call the land back movement here. The land back movement is a movement that um, has been, uh, it's all over North America. and. Wherever settlement took place, I've been to Australia, New Zealand, and they're talking the same sort of thing, land back. What they want to do is they want to get that connection back to their, their original homeland. Uh, it's not a matter of owning the land per se, but it's a matter of being able to freely travel on it, uh, be able to uh, live on it if they can, this type of thing. So it's... Uh, um, it's all over North America and South America as well. Uh, our people are very closely connected to the land. Uh, when, when we go to the Cypress Hills, everybody I've talked to has gone there. They felt this very special kind of uh, feeling came over them. And they, they felt that the, the spirits were coming back to them. They were in the hills where our ancestors lived. 
And uh, we sent a group of young men down there with the uh, clean up some of the uh, pine beetle infestation. And um, they uh, they came back just totally in love with the place. And these are flatlanders from, you know, <laughs> around North Battleford. So they really, uh, really do care for the place. Uh, this uh, process of, uh, of removing our people from the land goes back right to the very beginning of settlement here, of course. But in, um, the, one of the biggest uh, culprits has been the national park system. Um, and uh, if you look at the Waska Sioux National Park, for example, at one time there was an indigenous uh, community at the Narrows there where Waska Sioux Narrow, Lake Narrows down. And if you go walking back in the forest there, you'll find old uh, concrete uh, uh, foundations for buildings and houses and stuff. Uh, there was a lake to the north uh, called the Valley Lake in the north part of the park. It was uh, set aside as a pelican uh, sanctuary, but it was once a Métis family called the Valley lived up there and they, they were removed and they had to search for a new home. The people who lived at the Narrows were relocated onto Montreal Lake First Nation. And uh, the same thing happened in the uh, Banff National Park. Banff was the homeland to the, uh, the Nakoda people at the uh, Stony Reserve. Also the Siksika people on the Blackfoot Reserve further outside of Calgary. They would go in there and hunt in the mountains as far, so, as far west as, the, uh, as Eisenhower Mountain. So our people had a lot of uh, connection with this, uh, with a lot of the land that are a lot. A lot of people don't realize uh, we didn't just stay in one place or live only on the plains. We would travel deep into the mountains, and because uh, these these were places where there was good hunting and this sort of thing, so it was only natural our people would end up in there. Now, in 1930, the natural resources of the three prairie provinces were transferred from the federal government to the provinces. And the First Nations were left out of any discussions. Although we claimed that under treaty, we were to have a share of natural resources. And uh, the provinces attained all the tax revenue and everything, resource revenue and everything that came from the resources. And there was no discussion whatsoever about indigenous rights. The only right that was really brought up was the fact that if any reserves, if any, any First Nations needed additional land to satisfy treaty, the province was to provide it out of uh, Crown land. And that, that of course hasn't happened. They've uh, taken the Crown land and uh, the, the provincial government now is selling it off like crazy. And our people don't even, if, if they have treaty land entitlement, they're not able to, to move fast enough to get a hold of it. This is just being done right under our nose. So it's, a, it's an ongoing sort of battle to, uh, to get our share, a fair share of the land and to, uh, and to you know, build up, a, uh, we, we need to build up an economy and to build up a, a steady income. Right now, the only income coming out of reserves is that income which comes from the Department of Indian Affairs and that handles education and uh, well, the welfare program and a few other programs like that. There's no money for very little money for economic development and uh, very little money for, for anything else. It's only these big land claim settlements where our people are able to, uh, to develop properly. And um, one of the things also is that in Indian country, the uh, old um, real estate maximum of our maximum, I should say, of location, location, location is what matters. The uh, people uh, close to reserves, like the Sutina Reservation outside of uh, city of Calgary, are able to lease land and uh, uh, develop businesses on reserves and, and, and integrate into the local urban economy and able to, uh, to thrive as a result. But if you're a reserve in the back country of Saskatchewan, it's very difficult to uh, to, uh, to do that. So what we're doing now is reserves like my reserve and others, uh, we took our treaty land entitlement and we purchased land within or beside urban areas. Uh, my reserve, for example, we purchased land 
outside of uh, the city of Saskatoon, just north of Wanuskewin. We have a piece of land on the Yellowhead Highway, just outside of North Battleford. We've got about uh, four or five quarters there, I think, quite a bit. And then we got one quarter of land inside the city limits of Lloydminster. So we've been able to uh, to develop a uh, an urban presence, which uh, future generations will develop. So we're looking when when we buy land and we do stuff like this, we're thinking not just of ourselves, but several generations down the road. Uh, we're, 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 we buy it, we we make our plans for other you know for other generations to come, and so that's uh, you know. It's, it's a totally different thing, like I said earlier. We're not there to flip land. We're not there to make a quick buck. We're there to build and build along uh, alongside the rest of the Saskatchewan economy. So <clears throat> I think one of the other things I'd like to bring up is that we have to look, I, I'm talking about the future and uh, I, I have a, a very mixed feeling. And on one hand, I, I'm very hopeful. On the other hand, I have a lot of concerns. Uh, our, our population is not growing in one general direction. There's a group of people, and I would put myself in there, and then have got an education and, and, and chased the Canadian dream and bought real estate in cities and did well for ourselves. And our children have gone on and uh, they've got careers and hopefully our grandchildren will do the same. So we were, we're on an upward trajectory. There are other people who are living on in, in the rural areas um, are quite content with, with the type of lifestyle they have where they work part-time and take part-times off and this sort of thing, but they're still I would say an upward tra trajectory because that's just the nature of uh, our, our work for a lot of people. Uh, by that, I mean, specifically in the North, uh, you go up to Lac La Ronge and people will uh, go commercial fishing in the summer, trapping in the winter, harvesting wild rice in the fall. Uh, they'll be carpenters. They'll do all kinds of different things that follow a, a pattern. So that, that's a different kind of lifestyle, but it's, it's one that I, it's healthy and people are doing well on it. On the other side, there are there there is this, the, the issue of poverty and the the uh, pathologies that accompany poverty of alcohol and drug abuse and this type of thing. And uh, we have things like uh, amphetamines and, and uh, these type of drugs moving into uh, into uh, Indian country. And uh, in the States, this happened. It was went across the country and it was called the Prairie Fire. And we have the same sort of thing happening in Saskatchewan right now. We have a Prairie Fire. It's in the cities and it's on the reserves. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that we have to contain and we have to work with. Uh, we can't do it alone. We need assistance from, it's, 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 a, it's a health problem. It's a social problem. And addictions are a dreadful thing. Um, I just, well, I've been in, Van, I'm in, Van, I was, it was in Vancouver and uh, I saw the terrible end result of addictions down there on West East Hastings and places like that. And uh, I really fear for our people that uh, we have to get a hold of this and, and nip it and get rid of it. Uh, the other thing that's accompanying this rapid growth and rapid development of our people is the population growth. It's in the turn of the century, 1800, 1900, there were 10,000 indigenous people listed in Saskatchewan. Now in, after the war, 1950, that population had doubled to 20,000. By the time I started work in Saskatchewan in the 1970s. I think we had 37,000 people, close to 40,000 people in about 1975. By the end of the decade, or end of, yeah, end of the, yeah, end of the year, the century, pardon me, 
there were 85,000 indigenous people in Saskatchewan population. And in the last two decades, that number has doubled. There's 165,000 registered Indians in Saskatchewan based on Indian affairs statistics. And the next thing is what's going to happen two more decades? Are we going to double again? And after that, how far, how, how high is it going to go? Um, we're going to be a major, major factor in Saskatchewan. And we already are at 165,000. Us plus the Métis people put us into at least a quarter of the population now. But by the, by the middle of this decade, by the middle of this century, I should say, we're going to be over half the population in Saskatchewan. So yes, uh, there, it's, a, it's a major change, the shift that's happening. I talked about the shift from rural to urban, the loss of the family farm, and now we have the growth of the indigenous population. So the province by the end of this century is going to look very different from what we started out with. So uh, I think uh, it's something that everybody has to be concerned about. Um, we have about 15 to 20,000 young people entering the workforce every year uh, or going on to high school, going on to post-secondary education. That's an enormous number. And uh, we have to we have to find work for them, we have to find jobs for them, we have to find housing for them. There's so much we have to do. I was doing some uh, video work for, uh, for the Saskatchewan Indian or Science uh, Technical School. And uh, I was in the North Battleford Technical Institute and uh, I was amazed. Everywhere I looked, I, don't, I didn't get the exact stat statistical number, but I'd say over half the student population was First Nations. So where people are getting an education, they're moving on, and they're going to be part of this new economy. So uh, that uh, things are, like I said, things are changing. Our people are growing very rapidly. And uh, we have to grow an educational level. We have to grow in our economic activity. And we are going to be getting more and more members of parliament and members of the legislature and members of urban uh, councils and so on and so forth. So we're living in a rapid change in Indian country. And um, we're going to, we see, we're seeing a, uh, a rapid surge in cultural development, a return to traditional religion and exciting new approaches to health and social problems and so on. So anyway, to the return to reconciliation, we have so much to, to look forward to. We have so much to develop, and um, I'm, I'm really, uh, uh, I'm really, really looking forward to the future. It's a real challenge for us. I know we're going to have more people in the professions and in legislature and representing all different parties. It's not a partisan statement I want to make here, but we're going to be at all different levels. So. Um, Anyway, uh, I'd just like to say that I'm, I'm happy to have had this chance to talk to you this evening. Uh, it's, it's awkward talking to a computer screen, but I do see people in the back of the room there. There are people. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be more than willing to take them now. <laughs>